uh, these republics. Now, as for the borders within which borders we are going to recognize these republics. But we have already recognized them. It means that we have recognized all their founding documents, including the Constitution, and the Constitution enshrines the, their borders within the borders of the Donetsk and Lugansk regions when they were part of Ukraine. And we hope, and I would like to emphasize that, that all the these matters, all these controversies should be resolved during the negotiations between the Kiev authorities and the heads of these republics. Unfortunately, now we understand that it is impossible because hostilities are still ongoing and more than that. So they are escalating, but hopefully in the future that's what will be done. And about the use of the armed forces abroad? Well, how else? Yesterday we signed and the agreements, and these agreements with the, both Donetsk People's Republic and Lugansk People's Republic, it has articles that say that we are going to help these republics, including with the military. And since there is a conflict with this decision, we make it clear. If need be, we are ready to assume the obligations, exercise the obligations we assume. News Agency. Another question about the Donbass. Uh, obviously, Ukraine doesn't want to recognize the sovereignty of the two people's republics. So our decisions are not welcome uh, with the, the Kievan authorities. What was that? What I'm saying is that uh, the Kiev itself uh, does not recognize the Donetsk and the Lugansk people's republics, and they're not happy with our decision to recognize the two republics. So after everything that happened yesterday and later today, uh, do you see any prospects for rebuilding relations between Russia and Kyiv? And if it is possible, what should Moscow do and what should Kyiv do to achieve that? These matters were raised during our lengthy talks and negotiations with our European counterparts, and we discussed that with the Americans as well a number of times. So I don't think we talked about it publicly, but I will now. Obviously, the question is what should happen from both sides, from Kiev, so that we consider this situation settled in long-term perspective so that the situation calmed down and we wouldn't talk about any conflicts, especially armed conflicts. So I don't think it's a secret. There is nothing secret about that. The first thing that must be done by everyone is to recognize the will of the people who live in Sevastopol and Crimea. And I have said that on many times. So how different is this as this referendum was than in Kosovo, this will, expressing this will. How different is it from what happened in Kosovo? Because there was a referendum there. And I would like to reiterate one more time. No one did that at gunpoint. No one forced them to go to the voting stations. They did it voluntarily, and they made the decision to join Russia. And we should respect this decision. Those who have any doubt, they think that they are democracies, they should recognize this because that's the highest form of democracy, the referendum. And we have said that publicly a lot of times, and that's the matter that we debate a lot about with Washington and with NATO. We are categorically against admitting Ukraine to NATO because it poses a threat to us, and there is an argument, and I have talked about that in this very hall a lot of times, and in this regard, we come from the assumption, and a lot of people talk about this in Western capitals as well, that the best solution for this matter would be if our Western counterparts 
could save their face so that the current Kiev authorities renounce from joining NATO by themselves, by their own will, and they would remain neutral. That was the second point. And thirdly, unfortunately, it's not relevant anymore. I talked about resolving the problem of the Donbass via peaceful talks and implementation of the Minsk agreements. And finally, the most important thing, for everything that has been said before could be turned around in one moment if our so-called partners will pump the current Kyiv authorities with the state-of-the-art weaponry. So that's the most important thing. To a certain extent, current Ukraine should be demilitarized because that's the only factor that could be controlled, that could be monitored, that could be reacted to, because everything else could be changed tomorrow, like the current head of Ukraine did when he basically started criminal persecution of the former president for this alleged treason, because he doesn't like the Minsk agreements. And they could also disavow all the agreements that I have just spoken about if they were to be adopted by the current authorities. He could just move to Washington, to Paris, to Berlin, and we would have been left with the country armed country up to its teeth that has anti-Russian sentiments. But it's impossible after the current authorities are talking about their ideas. Alexander Yunushev Life, Mr. Putin, yesterday in your address to Russians, you talked about Zelensky's statement, not for the first time, I think, that according to him, Ukraine could have nuclear weapons again, could join the nuclear club again. But are these just words, or we face a real threat that next to our borders in Ukraine there will be nuclear weapon? Thank you. I've just talked about that. I believe that those words were aimed at us primarily, and we have heard those words. Since Soviet times, Ukraine has had uh, very wide nuclear uh, competences, so to speak. They have a number of nuclear power plants and strong nuclear industry. They have uh, the, the technology and they, they have the, the specialists, so it's very easy for them. It would be really easy for them to gain uh, nuclear weapons compared to many other countries that need to start from scratch. And you know that very well. There's one component they lack. They cannot enrich uranium, but that's just a matter of hardware. It's not something Ukraine cannot solve. This problem can be solved relatively quickly. As for the systems of delivery, of these potential uh, nuclear weapons, we there's uh, actually old uh, Russian and Soviet uh, missiles that have th that can reach targets a hundred kilometers away. It's very much feasible for Ukrainian industry to produce those. But what's the threat to Russia? Even if Ukraine gains tactical nuclear weapons, that means a strategic threat to Russia. That is what we must consider now. Because once you have 100 kilometers, then you have 300 kilometers or 500 kilometers, and then Moscow would be in range of a potential adversary's nuclear weapons. That would be a threat, and that is how we see it. That is why we have treated this so seriously, and we will continue to do so. So let's give the floor to Kolesnikov. Andrei Kolesnikov, Corazon Daily. Mr. Putin, how do you think? In the modern world, in today's world, could it be that 
that we could still be on the side of good by resolving things via force. That's the first question. And second question is more technical in your understanding how far, how far the troops can go until the contact line or until the administrative borders of DPR and LPR, maybe something else? Well, first off, I didn't say that right now after this conversation we will have Russian forces march into the two republics. Secondly, it is impossible to predict uh, the scenario that will unfold. That will depend on the situation on the ground. Now, as to whether issues could be resolved through force and whether you can use force and stay on the side of good, why what, would, would you like to say that that good forces uh, should be helpless or defenseless? Good should not be defenseless. Good should be able to defend itself. And that is our position. Thank you. Well, there we have it. The Russian president.